I am expecting our guest, uh, Darren Green, candidate for town council um, in Central Islip, um, Long Island. Um, Mr. Green is logged on right now. Oh, there you go, Brother Green. I, I almost I almost gave up on you, man. I knew you were around, though, brother. Hold on, let me take you off of mute. You're on mute, Darren. I got it. I got it. Cool, 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 cool. What's happening, Brother Green? It's good to have you on air with us. Good, Dr. Bob. How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Now I know that you have a relationship of long standing with um some of the guests the host of the show um in particular um damon jones and you um go back a little bit of a way so by way of introduction darren why don't you just tell us what brings you to the show today um what office are you running maybe how does your long standing relationship with damon jones has it factored into this decision that you're making okay so I'll give you, uh, let me just get my volume up a little bit. So as you, as everybody is aware, I'm Darren Green. I am a current candidate for Islip on Long Island, Islip Town Council. Uh, we now have councilmatic districts, something that was uh, a lawsuit that was handed down and the victory was won this, uh, actually last year. So the town agreed to create, uh, to go from at-large districts to councilmatic districts. Uh, which means that each area uh, gets their own representative. So how Islip is broken up, Islip is a town um, compiled into Suffolk County, broken up into different townships. So the town of Islip has a population of about 350,000 people. Um, but the section that, uh, the, uh, the, so now the section is broken up into four districts. And those four districts, my particular district compiled about 80,000 people. I have the largest district uh, that's been split. So uh, in District 2 is towns that compose of Hop Hog, um, Central Islip, uh, Great River, North Great River, uh, East Islip, Islip Terrace, Oakdale, uh, and Sayville, and West Sayville. Uh, so a little background about myself is uh, Damon and I go back you know, well over 20 years, both of us. I think I recognize you, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> and I'm, I'm, so I'm the current president of Blacks and Law Enforcement yes, uh, okay. of America, the Long Island chapter. Uh, I'm also the former president of the Nassau County Sheriff Guardians. Um, and I'm also the Long Island liaison, uh, I guess you can say, for the Grand Council of Guardians, which encompasses all African-American uh, law enforcement fraternal organizations or all guardian organizations in Long Island. So Damon and I have gotten a chance uh, over the last 20 years to be fighters, you know, fighting battles, you know, particularly, you know, the ones in Westchester, you know, uh, just coming out, being a part of what our attorney at the time, which was uh, Benita Zellman, Charles Billups is the chairman of the Grand Council. You know, we've, we've been fighting almost every battle that Damon has had. You know, I've stood side by side with him uh, even in the Kenneth Chamberlain situation, uh, when that situation happened, uh, you know, we held a press conference up in Westchester. Uh, we have done so much work together. Um, and so as a spinoff, once I uh, stepped down from being president of the Guardians, the Sheriff's Department Guardians, we decided to branch out and create a chapter of Blacks and Law Enforcement of Long Island uh, for, Long, for the Long Island chapter. Uh, and we just continue, as we still do, continue to fight these different battles uh, when it comes to law enforcement, when it comes to a, a, a term that Damon has uh, has cloned called criminality. And I'm pretty sure you've heard Damon use this term. We have been able to do that. So how we cross over is that we've been fighting these political nuances, you know, from the county executives uh, on up or on down as to how do we change policy and procedure as it relates to not only law enforcement, but as it relates to some of the things that, ha that have happened in law. So most of the shootings, the deaths that have happened to innocent people, the shootings of officers um, that have happened, you know, we have stood on the corners, we banged on drums, we held press conferences. We, we even lobbied for the, for the gun bill. When we got a chance to go to Albany and lobby, you know, for the gun bill when uh, there was a new gun bill that, that, that was out. 
But the thing that became most important is that we realized in order to affect change, you have to have a seat at the table. And for me, it's like we, we were able to get a lot of things done from the outside. But now I want to be able to sit on the inside and sit at the table and be able to not only affect change from within, uh, from a town perspective, but be able to help my town residents with some of the issues that we have uh, that are affecting us, not only public safety, but also as it relates to uh, our parks and our roads and our communities and how our communities have been grossly affected. Um, so that to me is a, a, a large component of what we need to do, particularly now here in Islip, is that there has been a large divide and that divide for how the council matic districts came about was there's a black and brown community, Central Islip, Brentwood and North Bayshore. Brentwood is the largest Hispanic community in the state of New York. And yet those individuals that live north of the Southern state or north of Sunrise Highway, for those of you who may have a demographic view, um, there was never any representation. So if you live south of those areas, um, those towns that were predominantly south, that were predominantly, you know, that predominantly white, then those areas in those districts were always well maintained and well taken care of. So now we get a chance to have a councilman to represent the areas of Brentwood and North Bay Shore, which was district one. And then I'm in district two, as I stated earlier before, which will cover the Hispanic and black community of central Iceland. So this is an historical run. Um, going to be the first time in 337 years of the history of the town of Islip that a minority or an African-American will ever be voted into any board seat. Uh, so we're looking forward to really getting in there and doing some really good work and changing some things over, but being able to have a voice and represent the people um, and so that we can try to affect change for those, those in the community. So as part of its reform efforts in recent years, Central Islip recently went from um, at large districts to single member districts. Yes. yes. Now I'm curious to know, just to put things in context, um, what was the um, comparison between the demographic makeup of Central Islip um, and its elected leadership under the previous single member um, um, at large district system that was used? Uh, well, as it stands, the Central Islip is, is right next to Brentwood and it is a, a large uh, Hispanic and black community. Um, but the representation uh, for the at large board was all white and is currently still all white. Um, so, you know, we want to be able to, you know, sometimes you hate to have to put a label on it, um, but the numbers speak what they uh, speak for themselves and you can't eradicate history and take away from what's already there and what's already been there. Um, these are the things that need, need to be changed. We need to go into these positions uh, and be able to have a voice for those black and brown people, but also being able to be a representative uh, for everybody from within the district. Because you, you can't just go into the district and say that I'm only going to help the black and brown people because that's not the way that the game works. Um, but we sure need to make sure that we are in a position so that those black and brown folks have an equal share and an equal voice for the things and the concerns that they have for the areas that, that we live in. Because I live in Central Islip, so I'm also going to be an advocate, a strong advocate and a voice for that so that it can be proportioned, uh, you know, put out proportionately. So, Darren, I know initially much of your activism focused on police reform. And indeed, um, as I pulled up the screen, I realized I had, in fact, seen you um, at some of the previous um, events that were put on um, along with Damon and a other network of yes. um, um, activists. But I'm curious to know now that you're transitioning from citizen activism to some sort of electoral um, position, what are the kind, how has your issue focus changed? What are the big issues that you think um, afflict the community of Central Islip? And what's unique about your approach to, your policy approach to these issues? Uh, a great question. You know, the, the approach is somewhat the same, but, but strategically different. So it's, it's oxymoronic in the way that it's said. Um, but I think from a law enforcement perspective, I spent 15 years, because I didn't really give a background by myself. So 
And to answer your question, 27 years in law enforcement, 15 years as an instructor. Uh, I have class uh, certifications throughout the state for, you know, suicide prevention, cultural diversity, for New York State facilitation skills. Uh, I mean, the list is you know, pretty large and I've trained with a lot of cross agencies. So how that affects the community uh, is being able to, to sit with residents, one, and listen to what they have to say. That's the biggest component. And that's one of the biggest complaints that we're getting uh, from residents, you know, all over the district is that the town has neglected the fact that even here, uh, some of the complaints of the residents. So it's kind of like what you have to do is you have to make room for people to speak you, you, even when they host meetings right now, they, those meetings are held at two o'clock in the afternoon. So who can come to a, a town meeting at two o'clock in the afternoon when the average person works, uh, you know, nine to five, if we want to say. So we're going to host a meeting so residents can come out and speak on their issues. You know, those meetings should be held in the evenings when people can come out and, be a part, and take part of that. So how that relates to the plan of what we may be able to do is we got to make some strategic changes. And we have to make room for the people. My slogan, the thing that I'm running on is with the people, for the people. And that means that we have to stand in the trenches with the people, just like we did for law enforcement, is we got to be able to come down from the dais, in this case, okay, go out into the community and talk to people, knock on the doors, as you do during campaign season, and figure out what is it that people want? What do you want to see changing in your neighborhood? You know, if it's your parks that may be an issue, is it your roads that may be an issue? Is it zoning that may be an issue? We have to be able to, to get that feedback and create that community connection, something that we don't have currently right now. Okay, so you obviously have been trying to make that connection with the community. You're in the midst of an election campaign right now. I know you've been out there knocking on plenty of doors. What is the some of the key issues that, um, people are bringing to your attention as you dialogue with them to see, you know, what's going on and how you plan to contribute to a solution. Uh, the largest component, uh, one, is taxes. Taxes are incredibly high. Taxes have gone up uh, more than 30% in the last five years, you know, in the town of Islip. So people are looking to say is that, you know, one, you know, how do we offset those taxes? Is there, there has to be a resolution for us uh, when you think about the entire county and you think about taxes going up in particular towns, why is it that the town of Islip has had the highest rate of tax, tax increases, you know, over the span, the last span of five years? Uh, the other major concern is um, particularly a divide for our parks and recreation. Um, you know, those individuals, uh, you know, we had a large dumping uh, scam that happened in Central Islip uh, a few years back. And uh, a lot of people were, were charged um, with that uh, on a federal level um, for, and the parks were cleaned up uh, after all of the dumpings had taken place, but there's still some things that were not done. Like there was supposed to be a spray park and a water park that was done. Now it took them until about three weeks ago for that spray park uh, to be opened. Uh, but when you look at other areas within the town that didn't even have a spray park, those areas were giving a brand new spray park, you know, and it was up and running way before the existing spray park was there and before uh, Roberto Clemente Park is the park that I'm speaking of, was actually fixed and updated. Uh, so those are some of the things that residents are upset about is that why can't we get the same fair share and fair treatment that those individuals who live south of Sunrise Highway as the people who live north of Sunrise Highway. Uh, and then the third thing that people complain about is there are some of the residents that do live south that have two issues. One is a zoning change um, with a, a building developer that is looking to uh, take an, an old golf course and develop it, but the residents feel that the project is massive, it's too big, uh, and the town hasn't heard their voices or responded to an email campaign. And then the third one is uh, there's a, a blighted college, which is uh, the old Dowling College. Um, the, it's the old Vanderbilt buildings, the original Vanderbilt buildings when the Vanderbilt's use that as their summer homes and that building the, the college is out of business the company that bought it uh has done nothing with the property the property is bled and those community members are, are now taking care of the property themselves spending money out of their pockets you know taking care of the broken windows the graffiti the uh the windows the stained glass windows the copper is being stolen so you have residents that are taking care of things that the town is responsible for but the town has told them it's your problem you deal with it. 
And so it's things like that, though, I've had a chance to reach out and uh, talk to community residents about and get that type of feedback from them. Okay. Well, I'm curious. I, it's no comes as no surprise to me to hear that one of the most frequently raised issues is um, exorbitant tax rates. Not just because tax rates are exorbitantly high, but also because um, Long Island, I guess, Staten Island, and <laughs> hey, I'm, I know I'm mixing stuff up. Like the analysis is all but, um, has has been a stronghold, a traditional bastion of conservatism, including opposition to tax increases. The reason that I mention this, Darren, is because it seems to me that we've been put in an um, irresolvable bind here in the United States. Uh, on the one hand, people rightly want their taxes to come down. On the other hand, we don't seem to recognize that there are pressing um, needs that we have that we got to spend some cash on. Um, yes. We're going to bring about an improvement, for example, of the physical infrastructure of our schools. Yes. Um, and I'm curious to know, uh, you know, how do you have any ideas about how to get us out of this quandary so that we can both have an equitable, fair tax system that doesn't put an undue burden on the more modest earners, but on the other hand is generating the kind of revenues that municipalities need to take care of the pressing problems that confront their community. Any way we're going to be able to raise taxes and can we do this all? Can we have our cake? And cake and eat it too. <laughs> uh, that, you know, that that is generally people say no. I mean, the answer to that question is generally no. Most people can't have their cake and eat it too. Um, but there are some cases, you know, that I do look at and say that how do we get out of this? And I think in certain townships, you got to start looking at other sources of revenue. So one of the things that I would be looking to do was one, let's go and let's peel the books back. You know, I use this term loosely because I'm not sure that we can actually do it. But when you think about the term forensic audits, when you think about what and what that encompasses, we got to be able to go in and look at where has the money gone? Where is the money being spent? And transparency becomes the key issue here. You know, years ago, I was an advocate for schools. You know, they created a thing called CFEs in the state when I was an advocate for a company with a community group called AQE, which Alliance of Quality Education. And what we created was a thing called Contracts for Excellence, you know, which is through New York State, which is so that those contracts that were given to school districts, that you had to present everything that you were going to do before you were allotted the money. And then when you were allotted the money, we could see transparently where the money was going to be spent before the state actually issued the money. So I think in townships, we got to be just as transparent as to where that money is being spent. And is there some things that we can do to offset the spending? Or the thing that we don't generally look at is that there's federal grants that can help us get out of some of the things or some of the situations that we're in, but yet nobody's creatively, you know, creatively looking at what are the other options that we have in order to help clean up some of our, 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 whether it's our parks, whether it's our, our waterways, or whether it's even looking at the infrastructure on the schools, which some cases the towns don't particularly get into, like in the town of Islip, we don't particularly get into the school stuff. But when you think about what it needs to happen, we got to start looking at other places rather than just constantly taxing the taxpayer when it could be another, another way or an option. Or, and if there has, if there is not a way, I think the most important thing is here is how about we sit down and explain to taxpayers where their tax dollars would be. Yeah, you can see it on your tax bill, but how about having a conversation? And, and I think that's what's missing. People are not hearing what they need to hear from the boards so that they understand exactly where their tax dollars are being spent. Right. I mean, I got to tell you, I'm an avid student of local government and I'm always trying to educate myself as to its internal operations. One of the real impediments to that is, to be quite honest, in the city of Mount Vernon, <laughs> Central right. Iceland not, might not be. Yes. Right. Same, same. yes. Um, a lot of the key documents that people need in order to follow these budgetary debates that we're having yes. and to figure out where our money is going are not accessible. And when they are accessible, they're very difficult to read. Um, I know that one element of a reform effort for 
government reform effort is to try to um, publish key government documents that are um, more transparent, easier to follow. Yes. Um, you don't necessarily need an accounting degree in order to make heads <laughs> right. and tails. Right, right. And and, so, and and I agree with you is that um, put it in layman's terms so people have a complete understanding of exactly what they're reading. Um, and you got to understand that also one of the biggest issues here okay. is that um, because, you know, Brentwood, uh, Central Islip, I should say, I'm going to speak to Central Islip, that because it is a large Latino population, okay, as well as Haitian population, um, we also understand that we have the, the dynamics, but it's a language barrier. So the town also needs to have access so that those residents that live in the areas that are north uh, of the Southern State of Science Highway have equal representation of language translation so that they can go down to the town and figure out if I don't understand a document because it's not translated or because I don't read particularly well, I'm a resident and I'm a taxpayer, but I also need, I may need a little help with understanding what's really written on this paper. So we need to make sure that our residents that are here have equal access as well as with the language barrier. And that becomes a really, really key component. And I think that's why a lot of residents have been really disgruntled and angry with the operations of the town because the perception has been these people don't care. And it's not that they don't care, it's just they haven't been given, been treated fairly and been given the opportunities so that they can have their voices heard. Right. I'm curious to know, um, part of this effort towards greater government transparency includes not just accessible documentations, but accessible hearings. Yes. And I'm curious to know whether the town of Ice, Central Islip does make your um, public hearings uh, available to the public so that they can review and follow some of these internal debates for themselves. Because we, it's, it's not um, been fully implemented in the city of Mount Vernon even yet. And I wonder where you guys compare, how do you compare? Uh, from, what I, from what I know in the town of Ice, the, those they do have a public access channel, and the public access channel gives people an opportunity to view the town meetings and have access to go back and, and look at them. Um, but one of the things that I found very interesting is that uh, recently there was a, a town meeting uh, that was had, and in the town meeting, uh, when you think about accessibility, um, there was a large shot, but what they did because of COVID, you know, these towns have a way of stacking the room with employees so that residents can't come into the room, okay, to, to fill the room up so that residents, and then it was a standing room only, and then they put a speaker on a TV outside in the hallway because they were expecting a large crowd, and the speaker did not have access for audio. And, and then when they put the audio out there, it was so distorted that you and they didn't even give a microphone to the residents that were speaking and then they told the residents don't worry about those people back there they don't need to hear you only we need to hear you so you have operations of this magnitude that are happening that does not allow even for when you're in person to even have the access that you should have i mean it's just unfair treatment you know as it comes to accessibility and as, as it comes to for residents having an opportunity to be able to either speak their voice or even receive information back gotcha so so darren i mean the central job of any um town council person is to write legislation and i'm curious do you what kind of experience do you have in crafting formulating legislation um i know most of your activist work um, probably entailed a different activity, other activities, but I'm curious to know, have you had an opportunity to, you know, um, take an in-depth look at legislation, review it, make recommendations to various um, state um, local panels as part of your um, previous um, work that could serve you well and um, if you enter into the into the council chambers? Uh, I have not written any legislation, but we have had an opportunity to work on legislation with elected officials, you know, in the past. And one of the things that makes my my, uh, my transition kind of so key is that, you know, for a long time is that when you're an instructor, you got to create lesson plans, you know? And so when so creating lesson plans, it, it involves the same type of documentation and research, because as an instructor, you're responsible for doing your own research Okay, and then creating and writing your own lesson plans 
that will allow you to be able to trans to, to transmit your lesson your, your research into your lesson plan and and transplant that into a board or into a lesson where you can verbalize that to your to your student population. So for me, I think it's an easy transition as you sit down and we look at what state legislation or local legislation needs to be had based on the things that we need to get done. Be able to absorb that information, review it and, and internalize it, and then be able to put that legislation on paper based on the needs of the people and based on some of the laws that we have that may be outdated or some of the policies and procedures that we may have that may, that may be outdated. Uh, and I think that's where the transition for me, I think, will be very easy um, from transitioning from, you know, public sector and being an advocate for being uh, to being able to transfer into electoral into an electoral position. It, it really is hard to overstate the importance of being an independent thinker who has research and analysis skills that you can bring to bear on a problem if you're going to be a successful legislator. There's actually no substitute for it. Well, right. it's just regurgitating ideas that other people are giving to you. Now, and, and a lot of those ideas have proven to be ineffective and we're looking for new ones. Um, now, even though you don't have any previous legislation writing experience, my sense is that you served on commissions of various kinds that have taken up um, important problems that are confronting our community and had to do a lot of similar kind of hearings and um, panel reviews. What were some of those um, commissions that you worked in or in the past, either formally or informally? Well, one of the things that I did was, um, again, I spoke earlier about this, this uh, company called HUE, uh, which was a community group that was formulated for Alliance for Quality Education. But we worked very ha handily with uh, uh, Citizens Action uh, of New York. Uh, and I was also, AQE was a sub-organization to a parent organization called Long Island Progressive Coalition. And, and I was a board member for Long Island Progressive Coalition. And they're a social and racial uh, justice, you know, organization uh, that actually, that, you know, gets out in the communities and works closely with all the elected officials. And being a board member, we had to actually sometimes, we, what we did do was we vetted different candidates who were seeking office. And we also went to Albany and lobbied. Uh, so one of the other things is that I'm also part of a coalition called, the, you know, what I do with Long Island Lobby Coalition, which was with another organization called Vision Long Island. And I've been a, a strong component uh, here on Long Island for working closely with, you know, Vision Long Island and actually taking bus rides and bus trips up to Albany, where we actually would lobby different uh, elected officials for the particular areas of what we needed. Uh, so, yes, I do have some 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 background. And, and dealing with, with, with local elected officials and working on issues of, of a really importance. And that's the thing that gives me uh, the greatest, you know, uh, joy is that I bring so much, you know, to the table based on the experiences that I've had, not only in law enforcement, but also in the political arena as well. Well, it sounds like you ha do have a wealth of experience that has direct relevance to the work that you're going to do in Unlike a lot of professional politicians who uh, enter the field under the sponsorship of established political players, yeah. these are skills that you've um, obtained independently while doing work for your community um, and therefore um, are only likely to further amplify that effort that you've been making. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm excited. Now, it sounds, Darren, like you've actually already... Um, begun to put a, together a coalition, a progressive coalition, yes. uh, cross-racial, cross-ethnic, um, cross-religious coalition to um, power your campaign. So I'm curious to know um, how, how are things looking? Who are you, who are you um, competing against? How many other contenders for the office do you have? And how does the racial ethnic composition of your district factor into some of the challenges that you see ahead of you? Uh, that, that is, and actually, well, uh, Dr. Bob, that is actually a very good question. Uh, so the campaign is looking very well. Uh, we're doing a lot of work. We've gotten a chance to go out and do, uh, again, give you receptive door knocking responses. Uh, got a chance to do a lot of fundraising, done some, got some good fundraising efforts going. 
Uh, so I think one of the things and how it looks uh, based on the, 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 the racial make makeup is that the district in District 2, um, outside of Central Islip, you know, is, uh, which is a largely black and brown community, the other communities are not black and brown. There are other communities are predominantly white. So one of the questions that I got asked when I first uh, got vetted for uh, for the candidacy was, how did he, if, if I was the chosen candidate, how would an African-American candidate think that he or she would be able to go into a predominantly all white district and win, and win that particular seat? So my opponent, who's the incumbent, uh, which his name is uh, Jim O'Connor, um, again, I mean, from what, from what I understand, he appears to be, if what, from what I've been told from some mutual friends that we have, he appears to be a very nice guy. Um, but nice guys don't always get the work done. Uh, and I think that based on past experience, I think some of the frustrations that I've had is that some residents are, uh, are frustrated with uh, not only his position, but the town that was at large. So how it plays out is that I've gotten a chance uh, based on my personality and based on the things that I've been able to accomplish. To me, it doesn't matter. Black, white, Latino, uh, it, it doesn't really matter the racial makeup. It's about making the connection with the people. And it's about, and, and that's one of the strongest things that I bring to the table is my ability to communicate my communication skills. You know, and being in law enforcement, being an instructor, you got to be able to stand, as I mentioned to you earlier, that I'm a, a licensed New York State facilitator. So you have to learn to facilitate meetings. You have to have conversations with people of all different races and ethnic groups on all different bipartisan or not. We have a job to do. We have work to get done. So I'm looking forward to working with all racial makeups and I'm look, also looking forward to working, you know, across uh, bipartisan lines and working with the, uh, the Republican Party or the even conservative party to be able to get things done that's going to further enhance the better better lives for the residents for the town of Iceland and particularly in District 2 because that will be the area that I'm representing. I see. So I, I want some clarification here. Um, you are the nominee. Are you the Democratic nominee? Yes. So let me right. So let me clarify this. Um, we did not have a primary, so I was a chosen Democratic uh, nominee. Uh, so now we're just heading into you know the general election, which will be held November second. Uh, we're looking very good. Uh, we're in a very good position as we stand, you know, right now. And I think that we we, we there is a really strong chance of winning here. Um, we are so optimistic. My team and I, my campaign team and I. We've done a lot of a lot of work. Again, we've gotten out to the community residents, and we're we're excited, um, but we're also focused, uh, laser focused on uh, the fact that we can't take for granted, you know, that, that there's an incumbent that's in office, and we can't take for granted uh, that they're not going to come out and continue to do the work that they've done uh, to order in order for them to maintain and keep the seat. So we got to keep the pressure on, and we got to keep keep our minds focused on the work that we need to do. Uh, we can't take this lightly or for granted to think this is going to be an easy cakewalk, you know, into this electoral position. Uh, so we, we, we're focused on that. Okay, so tell me, I would like any of our audience members, though we're mainly in Westchester, um, but, you know, we got a large reach, brother, so who yes, knows? Yes. Um, if there are anyone who is tuned in, who is interested in joining your campaign, can you give them some information about your um, website, social media, um, links, et cetera, where they can reach you and either to volunteer or to make contributions to your campaign? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I can be, uh, have a website that is up. The website is, uh, you can call, Google D Green for Islip or, or D, D Green for Islip, or you can go to our, our social media page, our Facebook page, which is uh, D Green for Council District 2, or I should say, should, should say Darren Green for Council District 2. Uh, and you can also, you can, if you want to reach out, you can reach out. I'll give you the phone number, which is area code 516-909-3864 is where uh, we can be reached for uh, those who may want to volunteer. And I'll also give you a, uh, an email address uh, where we can, where you can send your email. So, and that is dgreen council district two at gmail you know so i'll say that out a single word yes d green district two all one word at gmail 
Okay. Um, so, and, you know, and you can find all the information if you go to uh, the Facebook page, which is Darren Green uh, for Council District 2. On the Facebook page, you'll be able to access all the other links. You'll be able to check out all our information, all the videos that we've posted, and you'll also be able to access the website directly from the Facebook page. Uh, that may be an easier transition, or you can just type in uh, D Green for Islip, and that will give you the access to the website as well. Okay, okay. So, D, you're running um, on the Democratic ticket. Obviously, your your incumbent challenger or your incumbent opponent is. I take it he's a Republican. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Uh, the town has been under re Republican leadership, you know, for the last, like I said, 337 years. So, and, you know, in this, in this content, it sounds like it's a, a really uphill battle. But I think it boils down to now is that being able to have the, 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 the right candidate to be able to bring the right resources to, to the right race. And I think this is the opportunity where we get a chance to do that. Uh, you know, I just got endorsed by uh, the... Uh, I um, just had two interviews, I should say. One is one is an endorsement, which is the Long Island Federation of Labor, uh, AFL-CIO. Uh, we're oh, looking, okay. hope, hopefully, to get some endorsements, possibly from uh, other local leadership, other unions. We've had some interviews with them as well. So we need to hear back from uh, several other unions as well, which we're still looking to uh, possibly get some endorsements from the PBA uh, as a way to, because I'm in law enforcement. Uh, I have not had those conversations as of yet. Um, but I'm also optimistic that we'll be able to do that. Um, again, this is just historical in its content, but I really hope that people wouldn't also get so wrapped up in the in the in the historical content as more as it is important that we focus on the issues. And the issue is is that what can be done and what changes we need to make across the board so that we can have a better ISLIP and also a better uh, district too, because. Uh, what they did do is that in district ones and twos, district three and four are off years. So they won't have four districts, uh, you know, having an election all at one time. Okay, I see. So landing the endorsement of one of the nation's largest labor unions was a real um, yes. school in a way for you. Yes. Um, what in particular about your policies um, did persuaded labor that you were the guy that they should um, give their backing to? One of the things I think that's very key, I'm a union member myself, you know, being in law enforcement for 27 years, uh, understanding the contents and the nuances of what it means to rebuild and to build America. When we're thinking about what, what the labor force means and what the work has been done, you know, particularly on the East Coast, particularly in New York and the South, you can't get anything done without labor. You can't get anything done without the, without the unions having a hand and having the leadership that they have and the leadership that they have had to be able to get things done. And I think the Long Island Federation of Labor understood that me as a, as a union member myself and also being a leader, being that I could bring the type of leadership that they were looking for to also ensure that at some point in time that I could also look out for the members when contracts may be provided for those uh, union members in labor. And they think they understood that we share a commonality, which is making sure that we can take care of those union members. Okay. Well, listen, I'm going to um, interrupt our discussion for a moment to bring in the host of the show, AJ Woodson, who just joined us in the green room for the last couple of minutes. Brother Woodson, how are you today? My brother, it's good to see you. What's up, what's up, what's up? I just wanted to say what's up to my brother, Darren Green. And I, I really wanted to come on. I was with my partner today. I used to be in a school called JBC Force. We, for out of Central Islip, we did a record called Strong Island. And yes. earlier today, I told everybody we did a live and I let everybody know, this is my dude out there in Islip. Y'all have to support this cat. This is my dude. I, I was like, yo, look him up. Darren Green for town council. I was like, yo, look him up. Find out what he's about. Y'all got to support my dude. Yeah. Yeah. AJ, thank you. I appreciate that. And my condolences to you because I know you're dealing with a loss right now. So my condolences. Thank, thank you. Me. Thank you. Thank uh, you. But yeah, listen, I, pre I appreciate the love. I appreciate the support. You know, we've gotten a chance. We did a lot of work together. Absolutely. Uh, and I'm, I'm, and listen, let me say this, Dr. Bob, you know, you have your own history uh, of, of who you are, you know, and for, for your radio personalities and all the things you've done. And I, I can tell you that I am overly impressed with Black Westchester uh, Magazine, 
uh, and you know, people before politics, the work that you've done, the, the audiences that you bring, the, the commentary that you bring, and the conversations that you have with various different topics and subjects is so incredibly enlightening uh, that you guys, listen, I, and I know you've received some awards, but if I could give all of you an award right now, you know, for, it, it, for just being who you are, I would. You got no, you can't. You, you can't. Don't say like it's not possible. It's possible. Let's, let's do it. You know, we need, to, we, need to get you, we need to get you elected so you can give us a proclamation. Exactly. Exactly. So, right. Exactly. You know, that's exactly what needs to happen because you need to be recognized for the work that you've done and the work that you're doing. Um, you know, even though, like you said, it's, it's, it's in Westchester, you, you are standing on the battlefield and taking on key issues that are important and talking about the tough topics, topics that people don't want to talk about, issues people don't want to deal with. Black Westchester, people for politics, you're dealing with it straight up front. So thank yeah, you. I, I, I appreciate that. As you see, my, my phone don't want to stand up. I'm trying to put it and I hold it. It, it keeps sliding on the glass. But um, yo, I, I saw you, and I just want to say this, you know, Damien introduced us when I first came back to from Atlanta. I'm in Atlanta now. When I first came back from 20, at 2014, we started Black Westchester. I've yeah. watched you and the progression that you've made since 2014 to now. I watched your work with blacks and law enforcement. I watched your work out there. You know, we've come out there a few times. You, yeah. this, this brother right here, whenever we called him, whether it was in the city, whether it was in Westchester, he came, he spoke, he represented, he stood behind us. Every time we was in the struggle, you know what I'm saying? We've gone out there, I think we went to, well, um, uh, what was that with the, the 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 guy who got beat up? The cop that got beat up in uh yes, in, that was, in uh, Western Beach, Garden City. Yeah, yeah, yeah we Garden all went City. out to Garden City. Yes. Um, you know what I'm saying? So I, I I stand by this brother, you know, and it's like I don't say that on a lot of people. I've watched you. I've got to know you outside of your relationship with Damon. I've 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 got to know you, and you definitely are a man of integrity. You definitely are a brother. We shouldn't vote for people. I always say because they're brother. We shouldn't not vote for black people because they're black. But right. you are conscious. I'd rather have a man of conscious than a man of color, and you are a man of both. You you understand what I'm saying? Yes, and we man. need people like you to start running. And we've had this conversation. I'm Dave, Damon was used to telling you you, to, to, yes, you need to run for something. He was like, I ain't running for no office. I'm up in <laughs> I'm up in the cookouts and, and and you know Charles. Charles, Charles house and, and, and hanging out with y'all. He was like, I ain't running for no office. I'm retiring. That's, that's yeah. what you were telling me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you know what happens is, and, and it's funny that you should bring that up. Um, you know, Dr. Bob, you know, so it's amazing again when you think about people, the advocacy work that we've done and not wanting to get in politics because people look at politics as a dirty game. Um, there's there's no there's no truth into it. There's no really the substance behind it. So we all was like, ah, you know, we fight from the outside. We don't want to we want to take this fight to the inside. But as you get older and you get more mature, you understand that at some point in time, you know, somebody got to do it. Somebody got to take that leap of faith and somebody's got to step on the inside. I mean, Damon took a stab at it. You know, we supported him wholeheartedly with, with his run. Um, and then so I sat back and I watched and I said, you know what? We got to we got to make a better effort at trying to make the changes that we want to make. You know, we did all that we could. So now Black Westchester gets to publicize the voices of the people from one position. And hopefully for me being, you know, being able to, to get elected, should, should the victory be granted to us, it gives us an opportunity to work from the inside and also not only work from the inside, it's about showing other black and brown men and women in law enforcement or outside entities that you can run, that you can win, that you can make a difference, that you will make a difference when you get an opportunity. And you have to be able to not be afraid. We, there's no reason for us to be afraid not to be engaging enough to get into politics and be able to have a seat at the table and to help become policy makers so that we can affect the change that we want to make in our communities. It doesn't happen unless you're at the table. Absolutely. Uh, and and, and Eric, Eric Adams has shown us the roadmap from activist to elected official and doing some of the work that he's done from the inside. And now he may be the next New York City mayor. You know what I'm saying? But he came from that law enforcement background. He was protest. Yeah, I mean, from Damon telling it, him and Damon was out there on the front line protesting everything and, and, and fighting from the outside. And he realized that one of the things I admire about him, he realized 
some of us have to get on the inside and 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 and, and start attacking it from the inside. You know, so so we're not all just hitting it from the outside, just outside throwing rocks at the building. You know what I'm saying? You need somebody in the inside. Right. You know, and he and, and he was he was a good example of that. And I'm glad to see that you are attempting to do that. And I just want to say to everybody listening, sometimes running for an office, sometimes even even in a loss. You you get to debate the, the the person who's the incumbent. You get to make them start speaking about stuff they had no intention of speaking on. You know what I'm saying? And a smart person, a smart incumbent, even if they beat you, but you had 35 percent of the vote, they got to look at why 35 percent of the people vote you voted for you and what what it was that you were talking about. Right. So you know. That's why I want to encourage I can encourage my people to 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 run. But the other part is we as black people have to support our candidates. We support, we have to support with our wallets and not just our words. You understand what I'm saying? Like, why you think, oh, you see all these elected officials and you'd be like, oh, he's doing the bidding of the developer. He's doing the bid because those are the ones who put all the money up. Black people are the only people that don't realize we have to start to do like political packs and pull ourselves together and we have to Physically, there's a lot of candidates that would run but don't have the money to run. We have to be able to support them financially, and that's that's our job. You know, I just wanted to put that out there. And Listen, uh, you, know. you are you're hitting the nail right on the head. And I will say, Eric Adams is is, is a brother, uh, a constituent. Uh, I'm looking forward to him winning his election and becoming the mayor of New York City. Uh, you know, and he's one of the guys who motivated me to get into politics. Uh, watching his movements and watching what we were advocating and going to Albany when Eric was the senator and having Eric help us out and speak with Damon and I, uh, even being the host of certain dinners for us. You know, he encouraged us. And even when we got a chance to work with him, um, you know, his, 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 his speeches and his words of wisdom, but not only his words of wisdom, but his actions and his movements have led many of us you know, from to make that transition or try to make that transition to where we need to go. Uh, and I agree with you. One thing that people uh, really must understand, AJ, that you said is, you know, sometimes people will post and they'll say on social media, hey, Darren, I see that you're running. Good luck. Well, good luck don't always win races. You know, financially, we do need that financial support in order. So you got right. We, it is important that if we're going to help, that sometimes we understand the financial portion of helping a candidate because you can't win elections without money. It's just, it's just, it just doesn't happen. That's the with the key component, you know, is is relationships and money. You, you're raising money so that you can get your get your voice and your word out there. And if you don't raise any money, then it doesn't make sense. Right. And I, and I want to say one more thing on that is too, and I don't want to take away. We also need to look into campaign finance reform. Yes. Because. I've seen a lot of candidates who were the better candidate, the more qualified candidate, but they were outspent immensely by a uh, candidate that can't even hold up to the, hold a candle to them. But yes. they had the money. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. So there's a lot of good people who who can't they can't they can't compete because they don't have the money behind. You know what I'm saying? So I think we need to look into some kind of campaign finance uh, reform as well. So I, I, I just want to, and I don't want to take over the conversation, but I just want to, you know, knowing that area, the town of Islip, being out there, I lived in Central Islip, I've lived in Bayshore, Brentwood, I lived in Brightwaters, you know what I'm saying? Like, I've lived in the town of Islip, so. You, you got it all, you're right here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're you know right here. So, so, but, but, um, the police department at all times didn't look like us, and the government officials did not look like us. Right. You, you understand right. what I'm saying? Right. And, and and there was never a time as a kid in, in, in Central Isa where I saw a politician and was like, yo, I could be that. Because look right. at look at that example. I had never seen that. Right. You know what I'm saying? So you running means a lot in that area. And it's a whole lot different than when I lived there. You know, y'all got y'all got yeah. MS thirteen with them, them they took over them, them they took and over. So they took over. Yeah. Yeah. It, it has I heard been. I heard the I heard the three third precinct scared of them and I said it. Yep, I said it. The third they got the, the third precinct <laughs> show. Yeah. You you know the precincts, you remember everything. That's and that's good. So we, we I lived I lived out there. I lived right off Isab Avenue and right 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 in Central Isab, right off Isab Avenue. 
Right. So you right you right here where I'm at because I'm right there. You know. Yeah. Uh, and and that's key, man. That's key because you know we did have a, a huge gang problem that was here. I think the police department has got a good handle on it on it now. We were. I'm glad a, to hear that. Yeah. That situation. I mean, right behind you know where I'm at right now. You know, in the park is where they found a few bodies uh, a few years ago. Uh, mm. I literally, I can walk out of my door and make a right turn and be right at the backside of a park. Uh, which is now the PAL park. They turned it into a, a police activity league park, uh, but they and they cut down some of the woods. But they found a few bodies back there uh, that were gang related uh, uh, murders, and so victims. Uh, so I'm looking for. I'm glad that to work hand in hand with the police department. You know, a town of Isaac also has park rangers uh, that they instituted right. a few years back. Uh, so some things that have changed, but I think there's so much more. Work and they, you'll have county police out there, right? There's Suffolk yeah, county, county police. Yeah, you have Suffolk County yeah. Police Department. You have the Suffolk County Sheriff's Department. Which right. Does a great job, too. They have an elected official in Errol Toulon. Uh, and Errol is, is a constituent and a counterpart from the Democratic side. He's done an outstanding job. But we just want to be able to do a, a better job, bring better resources. And you said something that's very, that's very, very key, is to be able to have a representative uh, for the uh, for the men and women and the young girls and boys that are in that area to be able to say that I can grow up and I can be that guy. So for me to be a representative uh, for that, uh, so that they can see somebody that looks like them, I know that they they too can and can have a seat at the table is really important. So thank you for bringing that up. One one of my favorite um, scenes in the play Hamilton is Aaron Burr was his jealousy over Hamilton and he because. No matter what Aaron Burr did, he could never get in the room where it happened. Right. You know what I'm saying? We have to be in the room where it happens because yes. we cannot just do make change from outside throwing rocks. And it's good to see you running to be in the room where it happens. You know what I'm saying? And the council right. in every area are the legislators. You right. know what I'm saying? So we need representation as the and, and it's important. I mean, I I haven't really spoke about out there much. I speak mostly to Westchester, you know, lower the Bronx and all that. But but for my Long Island people, we need people who look like us as the legislators who make the laws, who 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 change the charter. I guess y'all have a charter as well, like we yeah. uh, whatever y'all call it. They yeah. don't, that's a very important position. And when nobody who looks like you has that position, you're a lot of times your issues and things that you're facing are not going to be addressed. Right. So I applaud you for running. I wish you well. And I know that your um, your experience in criminal justice reform and, and standing, I, I hope you being there because you've been in law enforcement on that aspect for a very long time. You can speak. We don't usually have a lot of legislators that understand that. You know right. what I'm saying? A lot of people, in, you know, so they can make they can make decisions that need to be made from that point of view. And we desperately need that. So I hope that people out your area that watch this, you know what I'm saying? We're going to share it all over Facebook and everything. I hope they see that. And 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 I don't need, and I tell everybody, I'm not saying vote for this man because I said vote for this man. I want you all to do and I know him. I want you all to look him up online. I want you all to do your homework. Don't take my word for it. You know what I'm saying? You've given your website and everything, right? You, you did all that? Yes, I have. So check this brother out. Hit him on social media. Look anywhere else he's speaking at and, and see if he meets the values that y'all talking about. And if he represents what y'all want him to represent, y'all need to come out in full numbers and vote for this brother and put him in office because the vote is under attack. So we need to, you know, go ahead. November 2nd. November 2nd is the general election. Uh, early voting, uh, I believe, across the board stocks October 23rd. Mm -hmm. um, but we need to get the vote out. We need to get the voices out. And I agree with you that if anybody has anything that they want to uh, address with me, that any concerns or issues, uh, by all means, I've given my information. I'll give it to you again. Dr. Bob, you have that information. Were you able to? Uh, uh, I think Dr. Bob is muted. <laughs> yes, he is. He is muted. Yes. Dr. Bob, you're muted. I said I posted the email address and the telephone number. You want to give me? Uh, yeah, the email address and, and, and the website is dgreen for Islip. That's the event, yes. I'm okay. sorry, I need to. And that's all spelled out. Yes, yes, thank you. Green for Islip Yes, yes. Okay. And uh, then I'll give you, uh, you know, that's the shorter version of it. Uh, hold one second, what happened here? 
Oh boy. Hello. Did I lose you guys? No, we're here. I'm, I'm here. You we okay. here. We hear you. Okay, one second. Something happened here. I don't know what happened. Uh here we go. Okay, I, I lost you for a second. Uh so yeah, I'm gonna go uh I'm gonna pull up this 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 uh website myself because sometimes uh, I'll share it. You can go for D Green for Ice Slip Town Council. Uh, again, that's the longer version. Is D Green for Ice Slip Town Council? Um, that's the longer side, but we actually shortened it. That was the original uh, version, and then we shortened it for D Green for Ice Slip, uh, so people can get all the information uh, that they want or need from there. Uh, you got it. Somebody got it there. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Bob, Bob's on top of it today. All right. There we go. Uh, so, uh, thank you, Bob. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Uh, and again, I just appreciate, you know, the opportunity to be to have an opportunity to talk about some of the issues and, be, and bring some, uh, shed some light on the situations that, that are here in, in, in Islip, uh, and be able to get to, to the residents. So that people know that one, there is, uh, a change now. We do have councilmatic districts and so not everybody is aware that we have councilmatic districts and that when you go out and vote on November 2nd, that depending on where you live in the town of Islip, that you have to vote in district two. Uh, so this gives us an opportunity to continuously, you know, get that, that, get that word out there. So people know that I'm a representative in their particular area. What, what, for, 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 for anybody that doesn't know, what is district two? What does that cover? The district two covers central Islip, That's Hop where Park, I was. Hop Bohemia, Hop. Uh, Great River, North Great River, East Islip, Islip Terrace, uh, Oakdale and West Sayville. Oh, wow. That's yeah, a it's whole a, lot. It's the, it's the largest district. It's the largest of the four districts that have been created into councilmatic districts. Uh, but I, when I tell you, I'm so looking forward to working with each and every, each and every individual that's in throughout each one of the smaller towns within inside the town within in the legislative, within the district, uh, to be able to really bring home the issues that need to be addressed. Because I think it's been a, a divide way too long. And again, some of the residents that I've spoken with, North and South, have some key issues. And the key issue is the lack of communication that the town has provided to its residents. Um, is there any questions as we come to the close of the show? Is there any questions that we didn't ask you that you want to tell the people? Is there any information that you want things, people to know either about you or about your candidacy or why they should vote for you? Uh, I think it's important. What I want people to know is that, again, I stated to, to, to Dr. Bob, you know, that my slogan is my campaign slogan. And what I'm, what I'm riding on is that I'm with the people and I'm for the people. And what that means is that I'm not afraid to come out and knock on your door and get in the trenches with you. I'm not afraid to come figure out what it is that you want as taxpayers in the town and, and within the district. I'm willing to fight the fights with you. I'm willing to, to walk with you. I'm willing to go to the schools with you. I'm willing to, 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 to bring whatever issues that you may have. Okay, doesn't necessarily mean that you got to come to a meeting, you know, on whatever day or night that it may be hosted. You know, if you need me, you call me, I'll come to you because it's important for people to have access. And when you're having an issue, I want to be able to grant them the opportunity to have access to me so that I could be able to hear what they have to hear, what, what the issues that they have to address and be able to take those issues back. And one thing I will say is we're not going to be able to address all of the, the issues and circumstances that people may have. But the thing I want people to really understand is that even though you may have an issue and if it's an issue that we can't fix, at least I'm going to get back to you and explain to you why we can't fix this issue at this particular time. And I think that's what people want. Okay, I want my grass, my lawn fixed. Or I want my sidewalks to be redone. Okay, guess what? It's not in the budget this year for your sidewalks to be done, but we're working on it and maybe we can get back to you within next year. I think it's important to get back to people on whatever their issue may be, not just leave them out there without having some type of correspondence or, or response backwards. And I think that is the key component that separates me from any other candidate or my particular opponent is that I'm a communicator and I wanna to communicate to my residents and I wanna be able to help them get what they need, not push away from what they need. I, I'm going to say a couple of words. I was only supposed to come on for like five, ten minutes, and I, I actually stayed. Um, I, I, I want to say two things. I love your commercial where you up, up at the front of the town hall. You take off the jacket. You like you. You're not afraid to get your hands dirty. You know what I'm saying? And and I, and that that was that was dope uh, imagery. Um, I want to thank you for coming on the show. I just want to publicly thank 
um, Dr. Bob, at last minute, he took over. Um, Lorraine had a medical emergency with her family and couldn't appear there. Damon, his granddaughter's birthday's today, and he thought it was yesterday, so he couldn't make it at the last minute because my teacher had him running around the Bronx getting three tier, three tier cakes or something. Um, right. Well, they so bake, Bob, they bake it all in your own cakes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Bob, so Bob, Bob, Bob held it down. I saw bits and pieces of it, and I just wanted to shout my brother because yo, yo, he he be holding me down. Um, I just want to shout my brother for a job well done. With that, I'm gonna let y'all wrap up. I'm out. But um, thank, thank, thank you, Darren. Um, please keep you. us informed with what's going on in your race. And yes, absolutely. even though we are Black Westchester, please utilize us, you know, to get information out. You know what I'm saying? And, and you yes. know, so we can absolutely. start covering some absolutely. more of the yeah. issues that our people are facing up there too. All right, thank you so much, and I appreciate I appreciate the opportunity. All yes. right, Bob, I'm, I'm out, yeah. Bob. I'm gonna let you wrap up. Okay, very good, very good. Oh I'm wait, but well, last thing, last thing. Thank you, everybody. For your condolences, I got a. I'm I'm hearing from everybody, phone calls, text messages, social media. Thank you, thank you. I greatly appreciate you. And with that, I'm out. Peace. Peace, everybody. Peace, AJ. Peace, AJ. So listen, brother, brother Green. It's yes. it's the show's officially over, brother. You know we could go on um, for for far longer. Yes, I, I appreciate the questions. You 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 gave me some really tough questions, um, but I think those tough questions. Uh, required, you know, the, the answers that, 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 that were appropriate to respond because, you know, a lot of times people will come on and they want to tap dance around some things. Uh, and I'm glad that you, you know, asked the right questions and some of the tough questions. And uh, hopefully I, I gave out the, the appropriate answers, but I'm not shying away from those questions. So thank you for being who you are. Well, thank you for being on air, Brother Green. I enjoyed our discussion. Um, I hope that we've <clears throat> raised the issue of your candidacy for viewers and people out on, on Long Island. And I urge everyone to get behind this man's um, campaign, not only with your dollars, but also volunteer some time besides casting the vote if you think that he can do a fair and effective job of representing um, Central Iceland. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. All right, well, everyone, listen, I'm not gonna hold you all up. I'm gonna tell y'all, I don't know how to do the outro either, everyone. So I am just going to say, um, we appreciate you guys being here with us, um, spending your Sunday evening with us. We look forward to returning um, at our regularly scheduled time next week. Um, and until then, everyone, peace.